Welcome back to another episode of the Magnus and Marcus podcast on coaching. Steve Magnus, cross-country coach at the University of Houston, author of The Science of Running, and I'm joined by my partner in crime, John Marcus, head coach of High Performance West. John, we are back and talking again. We're here. We're showing up. Doing a better job. Showing up as often as we can during these... uh, Always hectic uh, indoor season. So, um, speaking of indoor seasons, we want to talk about racing, right? And specific, yeah. specifically, mastering the art of racing, or as I like to say, it's racing as a skill. And I think this is a topic that it's almost like that assumption that we all need to know, we all need know needs to be thought of, right? Of course we need to learn how to race. Of course, of course. But athletes are just kind of thrown at it without ever learning the skill of it. And I think that racing in itself, knowing how to accomplish that and be flexible to do so in a variety of different venues, domains, tactics, all that stuff, is uh, something that is quite neglected. Agreed. Let me start by putting a pin in about what racing is not. Racing is not running certain splits for the given distance at certain intervals along that path. That's called time trialing. (laughs) That is a much different skill set than racing. And yet, many a times, that's the introduction to give the athletes the power and control about how to compete is by don't focus on the competition the other people focus on yourself and by doing that you focus on the time and while that can be a good introductory skill to learn it really doesn't have any place on the competition track in my opinion and we end up stunting people's growth as competitors rather than enhancing it by becoming so obsessed about what the split was because ultimately what that does is it takes you out of the present moment about what race you are in and who you're in what's going on on the track or on the road or what have you and then put you in your own little world where you're just playing this little game against the clock that no one else knows about except maybe you and your coach and that game is better reserved for the practice track so So, um go ahead so so on on this did you watch any of the uh australian nitro meet that they had on yeah yeah did you catch any so, not to go on a tangent like we always do, but w- with talking about racing, what was fascinating was I think it was like the three minute run or something yeah, like that. Mm-hmm. Did you see the like tactics that went into that and even the elimination mile? Like just changing the rules just a little bit, like influenced the tactics and it was actually racing yes. rather than, you know, this time trial type American thing. I think well, you, what we do is we put a value judgment on this time. You run this time and all of a sudden you think everyone's going to notice this time. And while that PR or that mark might be remarkable for you and your little world, you have to remember we're all just little specks of dust in the ethos of time and of millions and millions of lives who have lived and millions and millions of people who've ran track. But it's not remarkable if it doesn't break some type of universal barrier that exists the first four minute mile was remarkable now that's you can run sub four minutes for men and not even make nca indoor so that is a you know now a box or a stepping stone along the way but it's not the thing if i run a sub four minute mile all of a sudden things are going to come my way doors are going to open it's like hey good job kiddo you know keep moving forward and i think that's the thing we lose sight of in american time trial mindset is you're trying to do something remarkable when you compete. Like, oh, remember last year, right? That four by four, that Irish four by four, women's four by four video that went viral and like yep. everyone was all excited about where that girl was so far back and she gets the baton and she just goes, 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 digs, digs, digs. And like, that was racing. <laughs> like, that was awesome. I mean, right. that is what sport is about. And you and I and all our friends and uh, colleagues champion that. And that's exactly what 
we need to do is get out this perverted mindset that we've set ourselves in and said, time is all that matters. And all we're doing is we're agreeing to show up here together and time trial simultaneously, but we're just trying to get some mark. It, you, it, it, you know what? Uh, gosh, probably six months ago or so, I wrote a blog post on why we should eliminate times, right? And I got a lot of good <laughs> feedback, but then I got a lot of blowback. I'm like, oh, that's ridiculous. That's a dumb idea. Like, time, sir, what matter? That doesn't make things interesting. Like, are you crazy? And I get it, like, because we can measure time, right? It's easily definable. It's easily labelable. You know, for the rest of my life, I'm labeled as a 401 miler. Like, that is my right. designation. And, like, whatever your label is, that is it. And to you or to people in the track, like, track nerd world, that makes a lot of sense in that, like, oh, okay, like, he's run this. But to the rest of the world, no one, no one knows. No one cares, right? What they care mm -hmm. about is that 4x4 four four where the anchor leg might have run 54, 53 seconds. It wasn't a 49th split for that Irish, eight, or Irish 400 runner, right? And she was running down some people who, who split 59 seconds, like... Mm -hmm. But it went viral because the racing part of it. And I think whether it's like the Australian series that just came up with doing three-minute runs or something like that, um, I think it's incredible. I think that's the next evolution in our sport is we have to kind of go swing back against this pendulum of, oh, world records, try and run faster, try and run faster times to get impressive eyeballs. Um we have to move back to, let's get back to racing. And if that means eliminating the clock or having a countdown clock instead of, you know, a clock to measure the distance covered, um, then I think that's the way forward. And I think that doing that is probably one of the only ways that we can get back to this heart of racing and get back to where our sport actually gets some eyeballs on it. Because no one cares if you run 343 for the mile or 353 for the mile. It doesn't right. make it The narrative's not there anymore. Yeah. The narrative when you broke four was it was this narrative of impossible. It was, you know, your lungs are going to collapse. Your lungs can't process enough oxygen. Your heart will explode. Like there are all these doctors who said that the four minute mile was an impossible barrier to break. That human beings were not capable of that. That's why that got so much traction in the time it did when Bannister and all those guys got after it. But, you know, we don't have that type of barrier mindset towards any mark anymore. And so a world record is set. It's, it's, it's great. It's awesome. It's exciting. It's, it, it, you're expanding the human potential, but it's just a, like I said, you know, stone, a brick on the path. And we forget that the drama comes from how you um, interact and respond to the marketplace of competition on that day. I mean, you know, a good example recently is, say, Kate Grace in the Women's 3000 at the UW Preview. Here's a small college preview meet. And all of a sudden you have some world-class athletes and Olympians showing up. And, you know, with uh, – um, Hassan in there and like they're going back and forth and it was a great race because it was a race like yes Kate Grace set like the facility record or the meet record but it wasn't about running this time trial set the record like she came back on Hassan and kicked and mowed her down and that was pretty cool that was exciting to watch right and and more how, of that and how much attention did uh Genziba Genziba de Baba's 2k record which broke the indoor and outdoor record how much did it attention did it get outside of the the track world? Very yeah, little, I mean it's right? it's cool. It's like it's like yeah. when you hear, oh hey, this new car has gone Mach six. Yep. Like it doesn't even compute. I I drive a car every day. I don't even know what Mach one is. <laughs> I can't. So you say Mach six, I can't even compute that. It's like, oh that's cool. All right, I'm gonna just go about the rest of my day. <laughs> it, exactly, and that's the thing is that the the details, the whether it's three forty three or three fifty three, doesn't compute to normal people and we have to accept that like if there is a big barrier like a two-hour marathon then yes that's going to resonate but unless there is some barrier it doesn't resonate and we need to rethink <laughs> that and i think that that is a that is a way forward for track that needs to desperately 
be explored. Yes, without a doubt. And, you know, here in our pursuit of mastering racing, you know, there's we've identified the area you shouldn't focus on. Now there's different areas to focus on because you have to master, you know, in my opinion, as a middle distance, distance runner on the track, you have to master several different types of racing to have a whole repertoire that can be successful. You have to be able to master the whole sit and kick phenomena. You have to be able to master the surging phenomena. You have to be able to master the crank from the gun phenomena. And then you have to master the slow pace early. What am I going to do? Someone all of a sudden in the middle goes and some a hard mile or whatever and just takes off. And then how do you respond to that in kind? And all those races were on display at the Olympic trials last year in the 800 to 10 K distances for men and women. So if you want a good, you know, primer, just go back and watch every single, you know, prelim and final of the eight to the 10 K because you'll, you know, like the men's five K is a great example of our very erratic race. And it wasn't necessarily, you know, the people who were the most fit to run a hard all out 5k at that time but it was the people who were the most savvy in managing how to respond to an erratic race that put themselves in positions to make an olympic team and to me that's where you're, you're seeing the master of craft or composer of athletes really come through is in that type of high stress high expectation high stakes situation yeah no it's very true and i think we've lost a little bit of um, harnessing those different abilities, right? Because it used to be you were brought up in the high school system and you learn how to race a little bit in dual meets or small meets and larger meets. And then you go to college and you have to do the same at the conference meets and stuff. But even at the high school level, it's so much time, so much emphasis has been on hitting a qualifying mark to get to nationals or get to wherever and all that good stuff and get college attention. And then you go into college and you have to get your mark to make the conference meet and your mark to make, you know, to get into Stanford and your mark to get into nationals and all that stuff. And you have one legit race a year or a season, which is the conference championship, right? And I, I think that athletes have lost their ability to develop that repertoire of mm -hmm. skills that are needed in racing because they're not put in those situations. And I know from a college coaching standpoint is what I tend to see is everyone has their preferred racing style and they try to go execute it every single time because they know they're trying to run fast and that's what's on their mind. So this is their default way to race, to run fast, so they're going to execute that. And for a lot of athletes, if they get taken out of this defined, strict race mentality, they're just thro thrown for a loop and they go backwards, right? It, I've mm -hmm. seen, seen it all the time. It is, if the splits are off by a little bit, for instance, in the 5K, then the athlete like just goes backwards and just falls apart and you ask them afterwards like what happened and they're like i don't know i just wasn't feeling it you dig a little further and you hear like oh i had negative thoughts like i had these bad thought patterns once i saw i was you know 450 at the mile instead of 440 and right and it's like having that slow early mark or time in route almost diminishes the race itself like oh now it's not going to be a pr or it's not going to be a school record or something so it's like yeah who, who cares and like that's no oh. <laughs> that, that totally just you know diminishes the whole purpose of competition and that is one of the key reasons in my opinion why track and field is suffering that's the element in the room because when it's not a hot pace for whatever reason you know we kind of write the race off but who knows? Maybe someone's coming for the next mile and going to really put down the throttle and crank or crank the last mile. Like, well, and, and this is the problem I have with all that. It's like you hear it all the time. And you're like, oh, it's tactical or, oh, it's slow at the start. Like after this weekend Super Bowl, 
Did anyone say, did anyone say, oh, this game was horrible because for three quarters of the game, I don't know, the score was what, 28 to three or something like that? Sure. At, at You know, after three quarters? No. Afterwards, all my kids were going nuts talking about how this was the best Super Bowl ever because of the last quarter. So the last 25% of that game was interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you were a Falcons fan and you loved it the first three quarters. But for people who had no rooting interest, only the last 25% roughly was entertaining. And it is remembered now as the best Super Bowl, practically, um, of all time. Mm -hmm. But the same thing can happen in a race, right? And you have this dramatic, let's say, last mile in a 5K. And people will go nuts and be like, well, you know what? They ran 1410 because the first mile was, you know, 455. And it's like, no, appreciate the build up to the race and what is actually going and the tactics that go on and the excitement that kind of builds. And that, that's racing. And we've kind of just thrown that away while other sports have embraced it. The whole game is the whole game and what matters is at the end. Yeah, I mean, the first quarter of an NBA game is nothing to write home about, but you still show up because it's part of the narrative to watch it. And, you know, that's the same thing with you know, a race on the track. Like, the first quarter of the track race is nothing to write home about, but you show up because it impacts the narrative of that, that, you know, day's competition. And I think, you know, we're looking at this idea of how do you appeal to the masses. You don't. You can't. You Because if you try to be some something to everybody you become a wandering generality and then you appeal to nobody because you're not saying here's what i am still in this day and age prefontaine the name is known and he and how he impacted the sport from his racing style is something that is championed because he said i'm going to do something remarkable i'm going to do something different everyone is hiding in the pack everyone is scared everyone is told to play it safe and wait until the very end and then you know kind of sprint and create some distance but that, that's what i tell my athletes as well that i work with is that is hiding if you are not there influencing the outcome of the race you are effectively hiding and you are just a, a extra you know you're not really a you don't really have a role. You're not really a player. So you need to you know, prepare so that you are ready to be an influencer and have, play a role in this and go and make something happen and try and fail. And that's what all these preparatory races are for is to work on the craft of racing. And when people and athletes and coaches say, oh, we're just going to train because that's what all the big time pros do is all they do is train in mass for three, four months. And then they race one, two, you know, races a year and get their qualifying mark. And then they race the championship. You know, that trickle down, that's, I think, I think that's hurtful to the sport. And it's hurtful to what we're doing. Rather, that is those dual meets, those smaller invitationals. That is where you work on your craft. Here is feedback for me to go back into training and better do and execute what I'm doing. And that's where you can try different things where the stakes aren't as high. So when you get into a championship race, you have this catalog of different styles or things that you are experienced um, in real time in a real race situation that you're familiar with instead of getting to that point where you're like oh we didn't prepare for this i don't know what i'm doing oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh and then you know effectively take yourself out of being a participant or in the race an actor and just being an extra exactly and i think cultivating that ability to have flexibility is is number one on this things you know i've talked a long time with some of my college kids one of my more experienced kid brian barraza you know our talks pre-race on strategy is all about flexibility is here's roughly this large parameters of work here is your skill set that we know you need that you have and you decide when to use that skill set right it, it's you know it's one of those things it's like you might not have the fastest last hundred of that. So keep in mind when you're deciding when to move, right? Or whatever it is, you have to look at where your skill set is and use the tactics wisely to do so. And I think developing that skill set of racing is something that needs to be a point of emphasis as a coach. 
and one of the things that I always try to do is is before races say, all right, what are we trying to do? Like, what are we actually trying to work on? And if this race goes a completely different way than expected, then you need to have an instant like plan B, plan C to get your head around it and keep going, right? So I'll give I'll give you an example um, from this past weekend in the 3K out of a runner who was probably seated like 6th or 7th in the 3K. He had an 8.40 3K PR. It was going to be a low weight 20s type race for uh, for this meet. And I go, and he's like, what do we do? I'm like, well, just hang out for the first mile, zone out, and then just make sure you're with the pack, zone back in, and then that last mile, you got to know when you feel good and when to go and how to cover gaps. And he's thinking, okay, I'm just going to cover people's gaps and hang on until, until, you know, I feel good. Well, I think like 800 to go, you see him just shoot into the lead. And he just hammers out the last 800. And I talked to him afterwards. He's like, how do you... And he PR'd by 15 seconds, 14 and a half seconds. And I asked, like, all right, that was awesome. Great. Break it down for me. He says, well, I knew with 800 to go, I was feeling better than I should have. And I know I don't have quite those that great wheels at the end yet. So my move was to go and to lengthen it out and to wind it up all the way. And I wasn't thinking like, oh, this guy's got an 821 PR and I've got an 840 PR. I was thinking, here's how I assess right here. Here are my options. Do I just hang out and wait and get kicked down? Or do I, you know what, forget it. I'm having a good race. Let's go with it. And I think giving yourself that flex- flexibility versus this rigid system is uh, something we all need to develop. That's very difficult skill to be cognizant and process and be fully present where you're at in a race and not worrying about things that don't matter and distracting you from the purpose of where you're at and being able to respond. Now, remember, respond and react are two different things, right? When you take a drug, you know, pharmaceutical prescribed by your doctor, if you're responding to the medication, that's good. If you have a reaction to the medication, that's bad. And so a lot of times we just react to what happens in a race because we go in ill-prepared without a plan or without the capacity to be flexible with that plan. And more and more we need to think about how are we going to respond and being set up to respond. Like you said, here is a loose structure about what you want to accomplish. In When you are there in the moment, you have to decide. You have to take ownership of your racing. And then you have to go for it. And you go all in. And that's, you know, too often we look at a start list and we think, oh, what's their PR? Oh, man, they have a good PR. Okay, you just follow them because their PR is good. No matter that PR was set two years ago. <laughs> no yeah. matter that PR is, 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 is an old mark. But we tend to think because someone did something once, they know a secret we don't. And so we should just hang on the back of them because they have the secret and we don't. And hopefully we'll just ride their coattails to a new level of competency when that is still hiding. That is still, you know, not a good you know, thing to teach because it is, it is lazy. And when I look at a start list, what I do is I look at who are the players. And like I'll look, you know, say if I have some pros running in a college meet or something, and I'll be like, yeah, the college kid, you know, yeah. And they'll be like, oh, coach, she, you know, she has this PR goal. Yeah, she's a college kid. She's not going to show up and do any work. She's just, she's told to just suck on the back of someone and then hopefully yep. rally the last 200. And then maybe she'll get a good time because she just, you know, sucked off the back and had someone break the wind. And it's, that's not exciting. That's you, you can count on them not doing anything. And if it's easy and it works out, good for them. But if it doesn't, we should probably won't. So what? But if you go in and say, okay, here's a player, here's a player, here's a player. These are people who will show up and do the work and get after it. And you identify who those people are, regardless of PR, because you're engaged, you've been watching, you know where people's capacities are, you know what type of mentality they have. You know, that's the strategy. And then you can say, okay, do now just ignore the other 90% of the field. <laughs> because 90% of the field is there just to, you know, get a free ride, so to speak, to get some type of mark because they think that's going to, you know, all of a sudden open up some doors. But really, 
it just continues to open up the door that goes down the wrong rabbit hole. And that's not what you want. So another key thing in terms of mastering that, you know, that pursuit of mastering racing is that cardinal rule, you know, know thyself. And when you know thyself better and you're willing to take those risks in the smaller settings, whether it's practice or whether it's a, you know, low stakes race, then you can see how far that gap is to actualizing what you want versus where you are right here, right now. But then you have more confidence to be able to go do it when everything counts. Because how many times have you seen people, you know, running stellar times during the regular season or at these big invites and like, well, they're ready to play. And then they're nowhere to be found at a championship because all of a sudden there's no pacer. There's no, you know, agreement that everyone's going out at this pace, at this speed. And that part, that part's safe. And all you have to do is hang on and kick the last lap and then you'll get a good time. It's like, there's so many unknowns that you don't know who's going to do what anymore. And those people who came in with that, you know, amazing mark or series of marks finish, you know, dead last or don't even make it out of a prelim it, and these people that you know didn't are all of a sudden like in the final and ready to go and that's why i think you should put yourself in places as an athlete where you're going to get exposed before the championship times and um again example from this past weekend brian barraza my top kid who's running the 3k he's a longer distance guy he ran the 800 and it was yeah. a it was a one forty eight type race, and he ran one fifty two flat, which is a three second PR for him. But he was so far out of his comfort zone, and he was like, "I had no idea how to react to things, and I had to like trust my gut and get and try some different things." And it was I th- I think it was a brilliant um, learning experience for him because he's no longer in control of the race. Right, and he has to figure out how to maneuver himself and how to move like an eight hundred runner would when he's sitting there. Like, yeah, you can't just like make a move and fly past half the field like you can in a three k or five k. And, and I think putting yourself in position where, hey, you might fail or you might be outside of your comfort zone racing wise um, is is important. And I think also in some of the low key races like. I know a lot of times everyone likes to fudge their entry times and get in the faster heat so they can hang on and not do anything. But sometimes, you know, for instance, earlier in this year, I had one of my kids, I'm like, I'm going to enter you in about what shape you're in now, which is projected slower than your PR on purpose, because I want you to get used to having to make this race and do things on your own and not, you know, default to someone else. And I think putting yourself as an athlete in places where you're not used to, whether that's tactically, race-wise, or whatever, or even trying things that probably will fail. Maybe if you don't have a kick, just waiting until the last bit to see how you respond. Or if you have a strong kick, going from you know 800 out in a mile and just trying to wind it down, wind it down when that's not your forte. But trying different methods so that you can add these different skills to your repertoire um, is essential to me. And good racing is very vulnerable because it takes courage. And I vulnerability to me is a positive thing. Um, you know, I give Steve a hard time because he's at Houston and he hasn't gone over and spoken with Brene Brown, who is a vulnerability expert. But what she has to say on it is very enlightening. It's vulnerable, but it's courageous vulnerability. A lot of times we think of vulnerability as bad. But vulnerability is putting yourself out there, exposing you where you are right now. And it's so much of a a shell game early on in the calendar season that then you get to the championships and you have no idea what to do because you've been protected or you've been hiding or you've been told to do this very certain strategy that's worked enough to give you confidence and then you don't want to go away from what works in championship mode because you're stubborn and you're afraid but you're not vulnerable and so that courage comes in with saying hey i'm going to show up and do something remarkable here and it might just be for you but if you have more tools in your toolbox you can make a better um, house rather than all you have is a hammer then everything's a nail and that is just leads to sloppy work. And you saw that 
say NCAs this year with the men's 15 and the men's 800. I mean, Isaac York's just cranked from the gun. The Texas A&M kid, you know, cranked from the gun. They knew no different. But then as soon as you are told like, oh, hey, be careful, be cautious, go outside and be timid, people like that then all of a sudden are ineffective for the exact opposite reason because they just learned one skill, which is to crank from the gun, which is very atypical to teach. But they didn't have the capacity to be able to know how to manage themselves in the waters of a prelim, to manage themselves in the waters of a final against men. And those are different skill sets. And so we can't just automatically assume like you'd want. Here's an American collegiate record holder in the men's 800 who broke Jim Ryan's record. Oh, of course he's going to make the Olympic team. It's like, no, it, we want that certainty. But sadly, it does not exist it, because these are still human players and the human element of uncertainty and volatility is what you have to manage come racing. And if you just spend all your time on fitness acquisition and getting the engine and the parts of the car are real fast, but you don't put any type of GPS in that can think on its own two feet, then you're stuck. <laughs> no matter no matter how good a job you've done, and all that work is for naught because when we get back to what training is about, what preparation is about, it's about being, it's about readiness to perform. Exactly. And if we don't do that, and you tell me, author of the forthcoming peak performance book. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't lay that foundation work, then all of a sudden you cannot perform at any level, let alone a peak level. No, that's, that's brilliantly said because it's you have to have that foundation. And I think a lot of times that comes from recognizing that practice is not only physiological, but it is psychological. And so many times we worry about, again, hitting the times in practice to show that we're in certain shape, hitting our mile repeats at, you know, X speed or our 400 meter repeats at Y speed to prove to ourselves that we're in shape to do what we want when we should be thinking, okay, in this practice, I am going to set myself up mentally to develop the racing skills and the coping skills to translate over to the race performance, which is why I think a lot of times, and I know you do this, we've talked about it before, and we actually did some of this work last week, is is doing workouts where you change gears within the in the workout, right? And you're practicing mm -hmm. racing skills, and you're telling your athletes, like, all right, we're doing this at this and this at this, but what we're working on is, like, working through these gears, so that they're there when it comes race time. And I think that is often a very neglected part because it's much easier to say, all right, your your workout is eight four hundreds at sixty second pace with sixty seconds rest. Let's go. Yeah. And to have the hubris to be so certain that you're going to work this anaerobic energy system or this lactate energy system solely in isolation by this complex prescription of reps distance, speed, recovery intervals, that hubris, it, it, it really diminishes what you're trying to do as a coach. Yes, you have to be knowledgeable about those things, not discounting that in any way, shape, or form, but there's not as direct of a transfer to the mental capacity as we think. And a lot of times we leave the mental training wheels on. And what happens when you take the training wheels off, as everyone knows, riding a bike, it's a little wobbly at first. You're going to fall down. It's not going to work out. But soon enough, you get that confidence so that then all of a sudden you can be cruising down the street at 30 miles an hour on your bike if you're cranking it with a little bit of a downhill. But you could never go that fast with the training wheels. And that's, you know, to use another case study here from this season from an athlete, uh, a young woman, Eleanor Fulton, who has recently um, come down last year to High Performance West. She, in college, she would regularly just hide, hide, hide and sit and kick and hopefully get the good mark. And that's the training wheel is get the good mark or run the prescripted, prescribed time or a little faster in practice because that's the box to check off to tell you that you're on the right path. Now what we're doing is I will say to her, all right, we're going to work on because your third lap of the mile or third lap of the 15 is really ineffective. We need to work on that skill. And here in practice is the place to do it. So we're going to run, you know, 
1200 but what I want is I want that middle 400 to be at this pace. And I don't care if you have to walk the last quarter. If you don't run that pace, you know, this difficult shift of gears for that middle quarter, then you've all of a sudden wasted the opportunity. And yet we always worry so much about, oh, I got to be, you know, because we're so concerned as distance runners about this consistent energy expenditure that you want to evenly pace race because that is the most efficient. Racing is an inefficient reality. <laughs> Yet we try to make it into an efficient certainty and it's not. And if you practice just that efficiency, efficiency, efficiency in workouts, you make it so the athlete is ill-equipped mentally to do that. And so how that transfer a lot of this type of work where the coaching was it's okay to blow up on the end of the rep as long as the middle of the rep is honest or at this effort. And it took a little while for her to get that um, trust that I was not going to, you know, jump out, jump down her throat and just tell her, oh, man, you suck, you suck, you suck, because she didn't run the mark for the duration of the rep, but rather executed that m middle quarter to the desired effect. But once she got that, it was then came a race, the 1K, you know, and she's ran many a 1K at her home, you know, track up at UW. And what, and, you know, and they told her, hey, the whole point of this 1K is to get out and get after it. And if you don't, don't care. You just waste the effort. And after 200 meters, she felt the pace was slow. She was like, oh, I'm going to go lead this thing. And then she just went and she led the whole thing until like the last 80 meters and then got sniped by four people or three people. But – she led most of the race, which was something she never would have ever done in college. Never would have done. And, you know, yeah, she got a PR, almost got an auto mark to the international meet. Very, And had she played it a little bit more smart, she might have won. But the race would have been a lot slower and a lot less uh, of, you know, a work of art to watch and a lot less remarkable. So that's what you're trying to get after. And it's like, great, you ran, you did well. That's exciting. But there's still areas to work on, but at least you showed up and tried versus a lot of other pros who are in that race or even college kids, you know, who might have had better marks going in. They just were like, hey, where's the free ride? Let me take this free ride and I'll snipe you at the end. But it's like, dude, it's a preview meet of a 1K. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two comments on that that I'll make is, is one, you give them the permission to risk and fail, right? And I think that's yes. incredibly important as a coach to give. Like, you have to be able to look that athlete and tell them, like, I want you to risk it. And if you fail and you gave everything and you did everything, then I'm okay with it. I'm not going to get yell at you and get mad at you for running slow or whatever it is, as long as you, like, risk it. So you give them um, the ability to do that. And, and, and number two, I think it's this realization or maybe this perspective that the world's not going to end if you run, you know, five seconds slower than your PR <laughs> or if you blow up and have a have a bad race. You know, it, it's funny. I know our friend Phoebe Wright has talked about this a lot um, in her own racing, but I think it's athletes put a lot of pressure on themselves associated with their times and if they have this bad mark associated with their names and now everyone's going to think they're slow and now they don't have this uh, gravitas that they normally have and all this stuff and it you know it was interesting this weekend well the super bowl was going on i met with um a get good friend who is a drummer for one of the biggest mu musicians in the world right and he was, I was asking them how, how he deals with like the pressure of, you know, performing in front of, you know, 70, 80,000 people in a concert. And what happens if he messes up and how he keeps mentally in there during a performance. And he's, and he just turned to me and says, you know what, Steve, like I'm a drummer. I'm not a heart surgeon. I'm not performing like surgery to save someone's life. I am drumming. And if I miss something, I'm going to know, I'm going to feel bad. You know, a couple hundred drum gurus might notice, but in a couple days, no one cares. And we're on yes. to the next performance. And it mm -hmm. doesn't matter at all. 
And here's this guy performing with, as I said, one of the biggest music acts in the world. And he's saying this. And I'm like, you know what? Same thing happens in races. And we have to give ourselves that permission to be like, all right, if I risked it and it didn't work, or I got this time on my my side that looks makes me look slow, no one cares. No one cares right. at all. Well, it's, you know, distance running, the charts and methodology of having a prescription and saying, I'm going to put a quarter in, I'm going to get three quarters out of this machine of effort or what have you. That's very attractive and seductive to the highly perfectionist OCD, you know, perfect cult cultural mindset we have in North America these days. But the reality is good racing is good art. It is art because it is, that is why people are excited about sport is it's unpredictable. Now, what we do is we say, hey, we're going to have a pacer go out of this and make it very predictable. The equivalent would be saying, all right, well, the first two quarters of the NBA game, we're going to just only we're going to let people play until the score is tied 50-50. Then we'll have halftime and then we'll really play. If if people were said, hey, you can score no more than 50 points in the first half of a game and we'll let you just go back and forth and we'll take people off the court and we'll open it up and people can just go score 50 points, no one will watch the first half of the NBA game. <laughs> I mean, when that outcome is determined, you take all the volatility out of it. And good art is courageous. Good art is very vulnerable. And if you're going out and attempting to make good art and you fail, the only answer is make better art. And the only way we can make better art is through this thing called deliberate practice. And this 10,000 hour rule, as we know, is not 10,000 hours of going through the motions. It's 10,000 hours of deliberate practice with high critique, with executable, objectional tasks, areas that are concrete enough for you to get better and master, but you have to put in the hard yards. You have to do the training because you cannot see, you cannot listen, you cannot feel if you just have no training of depth behind you. And that is really what mastering the art of racing and mastering the art of distance running is about. So that sums this up great. Um, <laughs> nice job. You, this way I don't have to do it. Uh, yeah. I would, I would, <laughs> well, thanks. I, I would add on to that two things. If you haven't seen uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, commencement meet speech, which I think is called Make Great Art or Make Good Art. Um, it is. I haven't seen it. So you, <laughs> how, how serendipitous. It, it, it's phenomenal. And it touches on uh, some of those mm-hmm. topics. And then I think the other point on maybe a practical takeaway is is evaluate and then discuss these things with with your athletes afterwards. Like after a race, given time, is when you should correct and go over these things. And, you know, when I talk to my athletes, it's all right, all right, how did that feel? Um, Where did you think you went right? Where did you think you went wrong? Where do we improve on this? Like, what is the lesson? And we we break it down to like this bite-sized lesson. It could be, you know, you fell asleep at this point, we got to stay engaged or this gap happened here or, you know, you didn't have the confidence to know that you had the finish, but when it came time to finish 400 meters later, you had it there. It was there all the time. So it's about giving them a bite-sized chunk to improve these skills on racing after every race instead of saying, you know, good job, way to push it. And then right. mo- moving that's not on. showing up as a coach, you know, right. and that's maybe a whole nother podcast, but <laughs> that's what we have to do as coaches is show up and, you know, a quick, you know, case study again with Eleanor, the following two weeks, she ran a mile race at UW again and ran a PR about two and a half seconds, 435, which is pretty good, but it was not good. At, from my perspective, it was sloppy. Like she ran well for the first 800 and well for the last 400. That critical third hundred that we had spent all this time in practice trying to get her ready for, she defaulted to a scared hiding mindset. And so she gets done and she has all these, you know, her former college coaches, you know, her boyfriend, her friends, and all these great, you know, people who are supporting her, like, great job. Oh, you PR by two and a half seconds. Oh, that's wonderful. And yes, it is something to celebrate. But my first reaction, she comes up to me, she says, how was it? I go, 
I think I was kind of sloppy. <laughs> and it's like not to diminish the positive positivity of, yes, you ran faster than you ever ran before, which is great. But I would not be doing my job holding you accountable and coaching you and getting you and critiquing you to get you better if I just said, oh, good job, and that was it. It was – no, it was sloppy. There's there are, there are things to clean up if you want to be a competitive professional and distance runner. And that's – as coaches, we need to have that mindset as well. If you're coaching high school, middle school, college, pros, you know, age group athletes, masters, if you're not ch- – concretely identifying areas that they can improve in, then all you are really a glorified cheerleader that is giving them a chart of prescriptive activities to do week in and week out. And to me, as a coach, I have a really difficult time seeing a reflection of what I'm trying to do with those types of people because they're out there and there's a lot out there. And, you know, they're not bad, but they're just not on the same path I am. Exactly. Well, I can't sum it up any better than that. So, hope you guys took away some uh, knowledge dropped here on racing skills. And I think. And speaking of it, sorry, I, okay, Steve Lines, short. <laughs> I like to interrupt and keep it long. Old school book, I just thought about. It. One of the best old school books, because Steve and I are all about the old school books That's and right. the foundation. You know, The Deceased, Wrong Clark's, The Unforgiving Minute. That is. Very difficult to get your hands on. But so is anything worthwhile. You might have to shell out $200. I have a copy and I'll sell it for 1000 <laughs> That's That's how much it's worth to me. It's a good but one. You might, it is. But that, Ron Clark, for those you know who are unfamiliar with the Australian you know, multi-time world record holder, he would race fervently and you know, very um, frequently. And he'd run like a world record in the 10K by himself on Sunday, come back on a, <laughs> you know, Wednesday and run an 800 and get stomped. Yep. And on Friday, run a mile and get stomped. And then come back on a Monday and run a world record in the 3K. And, he, you know, he'd go from these highs of the world record that he'd set all by himself with no pacers, just leading and cranking from the front, from getting his butt kicked three days later, a week later. And it wasn't like, am I not fit anymore? Did I get out of shape? It's just like he put himself in challenging elements and challenging situations in a competitive atmosphere to work on his craft so that then he could, you know, have the opportunity to do the amazing things he did. And I think we forget about Ron Clark because it happened 50, 60 years ago. But he, to me, is one of the, you know, all-time great distance runner artists because what he brought out is he rewrote the records books. I mean, the fact that Emil Zatopek recognized that and gave him a gold medal, one of Emil's gold medals, that, you know, carries a very high distinction because, you know, it was a real recognized real. Emil saw what Ron Clark was doing from a higher level, higher band, higher, you know, eth- um, scaffolding point of view and said, you're on the same path or you're on the same level as me, even though you don't have these medals. You are, you are here. You are simpatico. And I think that is where we need to push our athletes towards and you need to push our colleagues towards is to move back to that. Because if we do that, art is compelling. Art is exciting. Art will get eyeballs. Art will bring people back to the sport. But it has to start at your level, whether you're at high school, college, you know, no matter the division, no matter how few people are doing it. Because if you can teach that athlete the path and they can better see and better recognize – then when professionals or people doing it on a grander stage are executing that, then all of a sudden that gets more engagement and they can, as they coach and grow up, can pass that you know, um, awareness moving forward. But if we just focus on the time, we're going to create a bunch of you know, time trial, you know, um, what do I want to say here, discount <laughs> superstore shoppers. Because that's what time trialing is, it's discounting what we're doing. But it, it, it's not getting at the core. And so again, Ron Clark's The Unforgiving Minute, difficult preach. to find, but worth, worth it. Just keep preaching, John. I'm just I'm just going <laughs> to preaching I'm, hour. I'm just going to go away and you Marcus can just, preaching hour. just preach. Uh, I I will I will <laughs> That's it. I'm done. I'm done. I promise. I will say that one of the one of the moments I remember from my own development, I think I was a freshman or sophomore or something in college. 
I, I uh, just ended up hanging out with Joe Douglas, who was the uh, agent and coach of Santa Monica Track Club, right? And um, and uh, we were at the same meet, I believe. And he just pops on this video of every 800 and 1500 at the Olympic Games um, since they could record them, <laughs> like the earliest mm-hmm. recordings. And I think it was like an old school VCR. It might have been. But then for the next like two hours, we just watched every single race, right? And every time he'd point out, oh, look what this one did. Look at this one did. And he didn't know who I was, right? But here's this guy just trying to pass down this knowledge, essentially. And he was fascinated by it and watching other super successful people in the most tactical races, challenging races, Olympic Games, um, that you could ask for. And I would challenge others to watch races, and don't just watch them, but watch them and ask, okay, what did this person do right? What did they do wrong? What can I learn from them? What skill sets do they have that I might be able to develop better? And, you know, just like any football or basketball player, coach, reviewing game tape, Do the same with your tactics. Exactly. I don't watch races anymore to see who wins. I don't care about the outcome. Like that is the superficial watching is I'm watching for the outcome. The outcome is a piece of data in the, you know, pageantry that is the race. But I am watching the drama. I am watching what players are doing, what hiders are doing you know, what wannabes are doing, what contenders are doing. That is what I'm watching. And when you watch with that depth, that's what I call seeing. And when you see better, when you're not like wedded to the outcome, even if my own athletes are in the race, I'm not wedded to the outcome. I'm watching the process. That is the thing that is going to teach me a lot more than you ran this time and that was fast. Or you beat this person and they they were good once or they were an Olympian last year or three years ago or four years ago, whatever, you know, and that is where that depth of knowledge of that art comes, comes to play and fully embrace your runner geek and runner dorkness. People call Steve and I runner nerds all the time. And we are <laughs> like, <laughs> that is who I am. I am yep. happy to say, man, I geek out on this stuff hardcore because if you don't want to go all in with something you're passionate and excited about, then that's a very numb existence in my opinion. And so, yeah, I'm all in and I'm going to continue to be all in. And, you know, that is what we're really trying to teach here is when you get athletes together and get people in a room, you ask, Hey, who here wants to be average? Who here wants to be mediocre? Who wants to just be a big part of the pack in the crowd? No one will raise their hand. And then you say, okay, well, who here just wants to show up and just let it rip and see where the chips fall? And when everyone raises their hand, you know you're on the path to creating the right culture because when you create that environment where it's like that is what this is about, letting it rip, seeing what you got. And that's what is the raw, pure uncertainty of competition. And that's what you're preparing for. That's what – if you keep that top of mind, the, the dark days when it's you know, wet and cold outside or the really hot days or the, the days where it's just nothing's going right or the days you got to cut the workout short, then in balance by showing up and doing the work – what you're really starting to participate in is a different game. Because when you watch superficially about the outcome, you're playing a finite game, which is there's a beginning, middle, end. But if you're just watching the process and you're trying to watch the infinite game that's being played, then you get a little bit more depth because the infinite game is about participation. I just want to keep participating. I want to keep racing. I want to keep coaching years in and years out. But if all you're trying to do is just get yours and be done – then yeah you'll be around on the scene for a year or two and there's a lot of athletes and coaches who are you know they're around for a couple years and it's like man okay cool these are players and then they just for whatever reason they leave because the price to pay to continue to participate at some point becomes very real and then you have to make that decision of will i pay that price whether it's personal finances you know investing in yourself whether it's showing Going up and doing the work, putting in more work, more miles, you know, getting out the door when no one around you as an athlete understands. Like, you know, I had a girlfriend one time before I met my wife who was like, why are you getting up on Sunday and running for two hours? Don't you want to spend time with me? I go, I do. 
it's just I have this church called Church of the Sunday Long Run, and I gotta go run 20 miles, <laughs> and then I'll be back and we'll get brunch. But she took it as this huge slight, <laughs> like I didn't like her, and I was like, no, I that's what I had to do. Exactly. Because that was my that was my frame of reference, and I was totally invested in that. So you know, again, um, invest in your craft, you know, and, and own it, own your dorkiness. Because if you don't, then you're then you're just you know a pretender, not really a contender. All right, brother. I love it. No, it's great, <laughs> great stuff. I just, I just can't top it. So, um, you know, it's not a contest. This isn't a race. You know, that's why we compliment each other. There, there, there we go. No, I love, love it. You preach. I'll, uh, I'll do a little bit of preaching with a little bit of uh, analytical science in there, and then we balance each other out. And uh, that's true. That's that's why it works. That's why we challenge each other. So. Mm-hmm. Hope you guys enjoy this episode, and as always, thanks for uh, reaching out and commenting. I know we got a couple comments last time, so um, thanks. It helps us keep doing this thing. So um, thanks a lot, everybody. Go make art and make better art. (laughs) 